back on to schedule. So we're now to Dan giving us an overview, and then the good senator and the good representative give you a historical pers hysterical perspective. <laughs> Jeez. So we're going to back up a little bit. Um, if you all want to take out your sheet that's titled Legislative Review of Major Substantive Rules, uh, especially for the newer committee members. Um, essentially, uh, rulemaking by executive branch agencies uh, must be done consistently with what's called the Maine Administrative Procedure Act. And among other things, the Administrative Procedure Act sets procedural rules for uh, the development and adoption of uh, rules, agency rules. Uh, since 1996, uh, there's been a distinction between two different types of rules, uh, those that are considered routine technical rules and those that are considered major substantive rules. Um, really, whether a rule is routine technical or major substantive is based on what the legislature says. Um, rules can be designated in statute as either. Uh, the rulemaking process is fairly similar for each of them, except for uh, major substantive rules have an additional rulemaking step in that they are, uh, just prior to being finally adopted by the agency, going into effect, they are what's called provisionally adopted, and they're sent to the legislature to be reviewed um, by the appropriate committee, and then uh, if it gets to that, voted by the legislature. Um, when the rules are submitted to the legislature. Uh, the, they are, the submission is reviewed for completeness. There's a number of uh, items that have to be provided with the rules. There's a certain number of copies that have to be provided. That's what uh, our office, um, along with working with the executive director of the Legislative Council does, our office being OPLA. Um, <clears throat> and assuming that it passes that review, a resolve is generated um, to allow for the rules to be reviewed by the legislature. Um, then the resolve is referred to the appropriate committee, uh, and then the committee can work those rules. Uh, the committee can approve the rules for final adoption. Uh, the committee can approve the rules or only a part of the rules for final adoption with or without amendments, uh, or the committee could uh, disapprove final adoption. And then that would obviously go up to the floor and be voted on. Uh, and. Uh, the interesting part, I guess, about amendments to the rules is that uh, you don't, you can't directly amend the rules. Um, you have to stipulate the rules can be amended uh, to require that X, Y, Z. So you couldn't, when you have your copy of the rules, uh, we wouldn't be going line by line and saying, cross this out, strike this, change this sentence here. Um, it would be more general to tell the department what to do. Um, the committee's review of major substantive rules can involve um, pretty much anything. The uh, statute, which you have here, um, section uh, 8072 of Title V, it's actually a couple sheets in. Uh, if you turn to the second page, uh, subsection 4 is committee review, uh, and there's a number of uh, suggestions uh, for what the committee's review of the rule should include. Um, pretty much, there's a lot of things you can look for, but pretty you can look for anything. Um, and I, I guess I did forget to state that uh, at any point that I'm going through this, if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Um, I'm going to try to take this as slowly as possible, but also cognizant and of again, time. I'm sure we'll go through it yeah. again as we're going through the committee. So smush theory will strike right. us many times. Okay. Uh, yes, Representative Campbell. Uh, I, when you were talking about the major substantive, one point that you didn't quite hit was the fact that the reason they are coming back to the committee is because earlier, or prior to this, the rules were exceeding the intent of the law. So the reason major substance was here to make sure they didn't exceed the intent of the law. That's why they were returned back to the committee. Right. And if you look at uh, the subsection 4 that I referred you to, uh, the paragraph B uh, is whether the rule is in conformity with the legislative right. intent of the statute, the rule is intended to implement, extend, apply, interpret, or make specific. So that's one of the facets of the committee's review of the rule. That, that was my intent for the law. 
Right. Um, I've also created a brief timeline of events, important events having to do with with mining. Um, I think the good Senator Saviello and, and Representative Martin may provide us with a hor historical perspective horror on star, yeah. horror, 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 go ahead. Is that a Freudian slip? <laughs> At least mine was I'm not funny. even sure what I said. And you said horror. Oh, a horrible perspective. A horrible perspective. <laughs> historical perspective. Historical. Um, on the rules. Uh, I think what I will focus on really is what happened last session uh, for those of us that were in here. Uh, the rules were um, submitted uh, on January 10, 2014. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether the rules were filed on time during the under the Administrative Procedure Act or whether they were filed late. Um, the resolve itself actually referred to them as late filed rules. Uh, we had the representatives from the Attorney General's office down uh, who essentially said it's irrelevant under the Administrative Procedure Act whether they're filed on time or not because the, uh, the law that set this whole thing uh, in motion, which I've given you a copy of, Public Law 2011, Chapter 653. Uh, it's titled An Act to Improve Environmental Oversight and Streamline Permitting for Metallic Mineral Mining in Maine. It's the big one, although not as big as the rules. Uh, if you all flip to the last page of that, um, Section 31, uh, as the Attorney General's office pointed out last time, uh, that subsection 1 in section 31 uh, essentially supersedes the provisions on timing in the Administrative Procedure Act so that uh, until the legislature approves major substantive rules that are submitted under this law, uh, the, for lack of a better term, the old mining rules remain in effect. Uh, and there's a little bit of a wrinkle there because the next section allows for some minor changes to certain sections in the rules that were already implemented, and that was a routine technical rulemaking process, but I won't get into that unless someone wants me to. Uh, it's, it's safe to say, Dan, on that particular section, that may ultimately be decided in the court, so, but, but uh, you're right. Not it's, something I would say. Not, uh, no, it's safe to say, I would say, safe to say that I would say that that may be, if we have to, which I hope we don't, might be decided someplace besides here. Right. So. Uh, in the end, uh, I suppose um, it didn't make a whole lot of a difference because uh, there was, although there were bills passed out of this committee and uh, voted affirmatively by um, both the House and Senate, they were vetoed and the veto was not overridden. Uh, so in effect, nothing was enacted by the legislators. Um, those are the rules that remain in effect. The so there were some procedural concerns about the filing last session that we had to deal with. Um, this session, there may be other procedural concerns, uh, not the same, but different. Uh, so as you all know, the department, for lack of a better term, refiled or resubmitted uh, the rules from last session. Uh, as far as I know, they are 100% identical. Uh, including, uh, we talked about this last session, there's some uh, grammatical formatting errors. Uh, the page numbers don't match up to the table of contents. Uh, and that, I think, was because they were rushing to get those changes done and get it in by the deadline, January 10th, last year. Um, so the rules are completely identical. Uh, we, uh, at the chair's request, we had a meeting with uh, Jerry Reed and Mary Sauer, who are to assistant attorney generals at the attorney general's office, uh, and they consulted, as I understand it, they consulted with uh, the attorney general before meeting with us. Uh, and the question is uh, whether there's an issue created by the department essentially refiling those rules. And the uh, position that they're taking is that yes, there is a potential procedural issue created by this refiling. Um, and <clears throat> as some of you may know uh, the process that the, the, the role the Attorney General plays in the rules adoption process, the rulemaking process, is that uh, prior to provisional uh, 
adoption of the rules or as an, a component of that, they have to certify that the rules uh, are in compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act. And they did certify that uh, as a component of the provisional adoption last year. Um, but another aspect that they play is they have to also certify just prior to final adoption uh, that the rules are compliant with the Administrative Procedure Act. And they have said to us at least initially that they have concerns about that compliance such that uh, if the committee were to uh, authorize in some form uh, and the legislature as well enact it uh, for final adoption of the rules in some form, uh, they may not be able to sign off on final adoption of the rules. Uh, however, while there is what they consider a potential procedural issue, they believe that there are a number of solutions, many of them that will be relatively simple to implement, that would fix that procedural issue and allow them to sign off on final adoption. Uh, they're willing to work with the committee and with myself if the committee wants to move forward with uh, addressing the rules and making any changes or passing out something that approves final adoption. Um, we would work with them to make sure that whatever is put in it would allow them to certify final adoption should it be enacted. Is, yep. is, is, are, are you suggesting that once the legislature refused to approve the rules last session, that those rules are dead? No, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone uh, has Anyone? commented on that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the status of the rules would be considered after last session. They were not. They were not at a point where they could be finally adopted by the agency. Did they go back to the Board of Environmental Protection? No, the process ended. Uh, maybe not ended. It, it just kind of. There's, there's, it's there's no. There. The, and I think. And let me explain to the committee, and I, perhaps we can get an answer to your question. Um, the committee last week, our chairs, were invited to meet with, as Dan said, with the Attorney General. Joan met with them, and, and in my stead, I sent the uh, good representative, uh, uh, Martin, in to have this conversation. And you might want to expound on, maybe answer partially, uh, Representative Tucker's question, as well as to what was decided in there. Well, the discussion we had was some uh, question of where are we in the process. And, and when you look uh, at the APA uh, uh, in terms of submitting of rules. It doesn't say that the department can't submit them five times. Uh, it, it doesn't, it says they shall submit. So uh, one of the questions we asked or I dealt with is, is, you know, what does that mean? Can you do it again? There's nothing that says you can't do it again. So what the department did was to submit the, the rules and subsequently did it within the time period that should have been done the first time. Uh, I want to go back just a little bit um, because I think that uh, that it, Representative Campbell raised that issue. Keeping in mind when I first got here, there was no such thing as rules. Uh, the legislature wrote whatever law they wanted, and that is what became law. Over time, the legislature got le a little lazy, and they started having the departments write rules. And and so uh, then in the in the early 90s. Uh, the legislature got frustrated with the departments who were writing rules that were and after we went home and do what they wanted to do when they couldn't do it before. So then, uh, then in 95 and 96, uh, we uh, changed the law uh, and created substantive rulemaking. So now you have routine and you have substantive rulemaking. And so the legislature can decide when it writes the law as to whether or not it's going to be routine or whether or not it's going to require that the department bring the rules back to the legislature for approval. And, and so that's the background to how we get to where we are. Uh, and, and so, you know, actually in all reality, uh, we could ignore all this and simply write whatever we want to in the law, and that becomes whatever it is. Uh, or we can use this process to amend and suggest what, what rules we want change and send that over to the department, which then has final authority to by the, 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 under that process. So after some discussion, when we had that discussion, it was clear that, that we can do what we, want, what we want to do with the rules. And at some point down the road, which is true of anything, you know, for $50, anyone can sue anyone. 
So, so they, there's always that opportunity that someone can choose to go to court, but whatever. Uh, and that's something over which we have no control. Uh, but, but that's where we are in, in, in where we are today. Representative Welsh? Yeah, I, I would just add, I think that um, what became clear was the Administrative Procedures Act needs a little work to better define. I guess I didn't draft it well enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, good representative, get to work here. But um, I think the, the, the key was the words at the time an agency provisionally adopts a rule. So that's what kind of we were discussing. What does that mean at the time and is a year later okay? I think where we came is that when we, if when, whatever we do with these rules, we can add a clause that said notwithstanding we understand that these were appropriately put before us. So um, that's yeah. that's the way we left that's it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I thought that if we changed the law, then that would mean that the rules were out of conformity with the law. Right now. If, if Representative ahead. Martin said that if we we could just change the law and not change the rules. Oh, would, this, no, no, no. no. no, no if you ignore, if you didn't want to write rules. This is back. Adopt rules. You could simply take whatever you wanted and say, make, amend the law. And those would be the law, and you wouldn't have rules. Isn't that how the old mining? The old mining is way, actually mining laws, you know, not so, mining rules. So, so that's really you go back here, but I don't want to go back to that period because, again, we spent a lot of time. The legislature would be spending would be a full time legislature. Uh, they be drafting everything. Represent Senator Breen. Thank you, um, Justin. Another question about the APA conformity and the procedures and stuff. Um, I was, I've been getting a lot of information as a new person, so I'm trying to sort it out. And one of the things that I heard was that um, when the department brought back the rules to the legislature, this, this go around, that um, we should have had the board weigh in again and we skipped that step or we, um, f since they had done it so recently, we decided it wasn't a good use of anybody's time. Um, so uh, I'm trying to figure out if that was part of the discussion with the AG, um, not just the time, you know, at the time phrase, but the, uh, the stops along the way in the chain of um, rulemaking does it in fact go from the department to the bureau to the committee? And so I'm looking for clarity on that. In the APA, there's nothing in there that says that the department has to take it back to the board. Silent. And, and it doesn't say that the department can't resubmit the rules. It doesn't say it has to. It, it is vague. It's vague. Okay, so there's nothing there that, that it, and that, that's the thing we talked about as to whether or not we ought not to draft some changes to the APA process as to what it is we want it to mean. Because at this point, either side can take the position that they want to, and it's, there's, you know, basically uh, nothing you can do. Representative Welsh. Yeah, and just to clarify for uh, Representative Harlow, we, we didn't talk about changing this in order to deal with our rules now. It was just more something that in the future might need to be said. Um, I, I was more just res uh, responding to what Representative, I must, might have misunderstood what he said, but I thought what he was saying is that we could change the mining law and then we wouldn't have to do anything with the rules. But you were talking about the APA. Right. APA. Okay, that's what, that was the confusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to change but the mining law, we could, if I'm couldn't correct about this, we could take the rules and go back into it. But you have a bill that's going to come at you on the mining laws that if we have to revise the laws related to what we do to the rules, right. we'll be able to do that. Can I ask another? Yes, please. Um, could I ask, Dan, what the Attorney General's angst was, just because we haven't heard that? Sure. Yeah, and, and I think the 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 Assistant Attorney Generals may have taken a different approach on interpreting the statute than Representative Martin has. Um, <laughs> they, they, uh, they agree, I think, that 
it's certainly not explicitly clear. But uh, they do think that there's a concern with the way it was done, uh, and that that concern, I believe, is significant enough for them that if there's not some sort of a workaround implemented, they will not sign off on final adoption of the rules. Oh, okay. So, uh, as Representative uh, Welsh pointed out uh, in Section 8072, subsection 2, uh, which describes submission of materials for legislative review, uh, the language that's used at the beginning is at the time an agency provisionally adopts a rule, which suggests that the provisional adoption and, and then the submission is supposed to be a relatively simultaneous process. Um, the the attorney generals did acknowledge that um, in some cases this could be a month, it could be two months, it could be three months, it could be a couple of weeks. Um, but I think the further you get out from that provisional adoption, um, perhaps the more of an issue there is. Uh, they talked about how you know the, the, the comments that were received are stale, um, how much of the overall Administrative Procedure Act seems to be um, structured with deadlines so that the intention appears to be to have a single uh, rulemaking process that goes step by step without any significant breaks from the beginning all the way up until final adoption. Um, so while I don't think they were saying that they are 100% uh, sure that this is a potential, uh, this is a clear procedural issue. Um, they're saying, I think, that they would err on the side of caution and not allow final adoption unless there was some sort of acknowledgement by the legislature that there is a potential procedural issue and a workaround to that issue. And as I said, there's a number of solutions. And, and keep in mind, the Section 31.1 is really why we're here, because under normal situations, if we hadn't put that paragraph in there, the rules would be in place today. That's really important for you to know. This is probably one of the first times this happened where something's been not approved by the legislature, been vetoed, and has now come back to us. Because to me, it's an open-ended statement in the Administrative Procedures Act. It just says, shall submit. It doesn't say when. It doesn't say how long after. Well, they can argue that it's stale, but it's a pretty, state, pretty plain statement to me. I'm not a I didn't sleep at the Holiday Inn, so I'm not a lawyer. But it basically just says, can submit them. May I? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. I just want to reformulate and try to understand your description of what the Attorney Generals were worried about. I mean, the Administrative Procedures Act says that the department is provisionally adopting rules, correct? So correct. there are rules that have been adopted, but provisionally. Yep. So once they're rejected, that provisional adoption ends. I, I, we didn't, we didn't address that, uh, and I'm not sure that's clear uh, in the statute. Uh, perhaps a better way to look at it would be that they're somewhat in limbo. Uh, I think we did talk about uh, this situation may have happened. No, no one really came up with the specific examples, but I believe uh, we alluded to the situation may have happened in other circumstances where a rule was, for whatever reason, submitted for legislative review. Uh, and the legislature um, did not allow final adoption, and the same rule was taken through another rulemaking process and provisionally adopted again, even if it was the same exact rule, and then submitted for review again. And I don't think the Attorney General's office, although I don't think they addressed this, I don't think they would have had an issue with that. But if you, if you go uh, to, on the, to the law that's on the books now, until we adopt r rules, there are rules. And it is the old rule. So, so the last thing we want are the old rules. And so that's really... Well, the we is now us, uh, because in, in the, the bill that, that I sponsored, uh, which is now law, uh, there's a provision in there that says if the legislature fails to act on adopting new rules, the rules that were adopted pursuant to the old law 
are still adopted rules. So when the department, as they, so when rules are promulgated on the new law, that provision is still part of that law. So, so whatever we do, I don't think there's anyone in the world that wants to operate a, we don't want to let someone operate a mine on the old rules. Am I confusing you enough yet? Okay. <laughs> but let me let me add to what what the good representative is saying. It, you basically have no uh, the laws in place that says she'll do this. You go to the old rules and there's nothing there to tell you how to do it. Right. So the applicant can go make up whatever he wants to do. That's correct. To be compliance with it. That's how we got to fix it. <laughs> yes, Dan, did the um, attorneys general have any uh, concern about the? step that I mentioned about going back to the board for their process? Did that come up and did they register any concern about that? I, I don't recall I don't if recall. that was mentioned as a point of concern. It was mentioned as, I think, an option that they, they could have taken, the process that could have been taken with resubmission of these rules, but it wasn't, so it wasn't something we discussed. Yeah. We were looking more at uh, if the committee does want to move forward with these rules, what needs to be done? The last thing they, the commissioner wants to do is re, is go back and try this all over again. Uh, I've also provided you with your own copy of the mining statutes, um, and it may be useful. Uh, obviously, we're going to if we as I imagine, are going to have a, a public hearing uh, on the rules. I provided you with my bill analysis from last session. Um, some of this will be irrelevant, but uh, just for those of you that weren't here, uh, my synopsis of the hearing testimony, what people have already said last time about the exact same rules, uh, might help uh, focus your review of the rules um, prior to the hearing. I guess I have two questions. One is, um, I don't think we've heard what the remedy would be. We've heard that it would be a bill, but, um, and the other question is, is that the, the case is that if we have the law in effect, and if the rule and the law are out of <coughs> conformity, then the applicant could do? Is that your read on that as well? Uh, to the extent that the, there is an actual conflict between the rules and the law, the, the law would win. Um, but. It's, it's a very um, difficult situation, I guess. Uh, there, I think there is some concern about the disconnect between the law and the rules that was voiced by the uh, attorneys general, but um, that's a problem for them. And that's been in the case for the past year, right? That's correct. Okay. And what's, what is the remedy for this? We're going to, as yeah, we the question work, was, what's the ultimate remedy at the yeah, end? Thank you. As we work through the, the process and we get to a point where we agree as to what the changes are going to be, and we basically remember we're sending that back to the Department of Final Adoption. And, and so it's possible to do that. And we can also say, notwithstanding the provision of X, Y, and Z, uh, that becomes the rules. So there are all kinds of ways in which we can get to that point, and the AG's office said they would help us to do that. And that's what your bill proposes to do? No, no. My bill that I have on the table, I'm, I'm killing that on Tuesday because we don't need it, because we have the rules. And the only reason I put that in was that in the event, uh, I didn't know what the department was going to do and I wasn't here, so I, I just put in the bill in the event that we needed it. And now we don't need it. So that, that will be killed on Monday, or Tuesday, whenever we meet, assuming there's no snowstorm. Okay, could I just ask? So it's table right now in the house. Right, right. I yeah, that. and I'll, I'll move to kill that on Tuesday. Okay, Dan, could I just, is there anything else that we've missed as far as the remedies? Uh, I think what we discussed with the attorneys general was that uh, a simple notwithstanding sentence or two uh, to write around what's creating the issue, uh, I believe, 
would be sufficient to fix the problem. Um, but there are a number of different ways this could be dealt with. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, it's up to the committee or the majority or minority of the committee to decide how they want to address it. Two, we move forward to the public hearing. I really would, I don't know if it's possible, but I really would like to put the word out to people who are going to testify as to how they would like the rule to be corrected, rather than simply saying, I'm against it, I'm for it. Uh, I know that that's, you know, and, and that, would be, that would be helpful to the committee. That, I that, think if they tell us that. Uh, my intent, and, and uh, good co-chair and I have talked about this, is when we go to the mining rules, it will be about the mining rules. It will not be about Bald Mountain. It will not be about Irving. It will not be about Tom Saviello. It will be about the rules and suggested changes to them. Um, and we will be pretty strict about that. Now, we have a mining bill in front of us. If someone wants to come and testify against mining, they're more than welcome well, to do and, it. and uh, Representative Chapman may have, and, may, and, 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 we'll and I that. actually have my bill in, too, that's sitting there just in the event we need to make some changes to it. So if we do have a hearing on that, nice that is, that, that's correct. I'm only asking the question because we've, some of us have heard a, a bunch of different versions, so I figure that hearing the real version here for all of us is beneficial yeah. rather than hearing from this person and that person what the truth is. What we will do certainly before that is the co-chair and I and the leads will come up with how we want to structure that. The hope is that if we do the rules one day, the next day we're doing the mining bills. That's what we're trying to target, but we are waiting for the one to come up and I don't know where it stands at this point. Well, I did talk to the representative. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Who was thinking and working on something. And, and uh, I'm going to be meeting with him next week. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of a different approach, and, and so it may be a little different than what we're thinking of that it may be at the moment. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. I, I would just like, I would request the varieties of us who are thinking about this and also talking to people who are, are invested in, and have some bills out that we at least are able to hear all the mining bills that are there before we move into work session so yeah, that good. if good. we want to take some ideas from one thing and, and bring it to you know another part of it that, that we have the whole picture and not work on the rules and then later on get a something else about mining that could be have been relevant to our rules discussions and I do have one question I forgot Dan one of the arguments in the last uh, rule thing was that the Board of Environmental Protection and I was very sensitive to them when I was on the pesticide control board when you made some significant changes within the rules that were being proposed whether you had to go back out to hearing again on that and that was some of the comments that were made last time and I believe uh, Mary Sauer answered that question but can you answer that for us that should they have been in her interpretation I can't answer for myself but what I she what she, she testified to in front of the committee last session was that she discussed the issue with all of them and was comfortable certifying that the rule was compliant with the Administrative Procedure Act. And um, it didn't need to go back out to hearing again. And, and that would include that as well. Okay. Just want to make sure that the rest of the committee heard that. Any other questions for Dan? Good to have our own attorney here. <laughs> uh, and I would also note that uh, a lot of information we went through today, if any of you uh, have more additional questions I'm always available to talk to right next door um, I'd be happy to go through with, with, with you thank you now now we're to Heather and Jeff and you're gonna go I'm gonna say. be safe I think I know what you guys are gonna say yeah I think so you know what we're gonna say you'll tell me if <laughs> and thank you both of you for being patient and sitting through this for the umpteenth time And thank you for, for uh, listening to us at the very end of, of what must be a long day for you. Um, good afternoon. I guess it's not evening yet. Um, <laughs> Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, well, she's still here, and members of the committee. Um, I am Heather Parent. I am the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, with me, I have Jeff Crawford, who is the um, Deputy Policy Director for the Department. Um, because this is the first time in, I'm in front of you, I'm going to give you 60 seconds of history about me um, in the context for why it's me and Jeff up here today. Um, I am, uh, uh, I have been 
named as the acting deputy commissioner as of May of last year. Prior to that, I was policy director of the department and had the um, pleasure of being in front of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee when this, uh, when the framework law came in front of the committee um, in 2012. Um, so I have been with this subject matter since, since the very beginning of this process. Um, when the rule, when the legislature um, voted to enact the bill, and when the governor signed the law, um, I recruited Jeff um, to be the the ringmaster of all of the various staff who were involved in the uh, rulemaking process, the writing, the reading, the the um, uh, analysis, you know, the research necessary, the rewriting. Um, Jeff has been the person who has been in charge of that since um, the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And uh, before I get into the substance, I want to make sure I publicly uh, acknowledged uh, the tremendous amount of work that the entire team did, um, and in particular Jeff, because when we were talking about rulemaking um, in front of the board at the end of 2013, um, Jeff was there from 6 o'clock in the morning till at least 7 o'clock at night, evenings, weekends, snowstorms, holidays. And so um, this is probably one of the only opportunities I'll have to publicly thank him. And so I wanted to do so. Thank Jeff, you. You, you and I go way back. Thank you for the time that you put into this. Uh, thank you, I Senator. I really do appreciate that. And I never really got the opportunity to say that last year because I know this was quite a task we dumped on the DEP. And, and for you to take the lead, I, I really do appreciate that, knowing all the work you do do. Uh, because you've heard a lot uh, so far today and because it's late in the day, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history just to put some things into context and to clear up some um, misconceptions and then I'll get into the framework if that's uh, all right with, with the Senator and the committee. Um, one of the items that I want to note as far as the, uh, from when the framework law was developed um, at the legislature in 2012 was that although I was frequently sitting in this seat in front of this committee, uh, in front of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, I always had um, a staffer with me on the subject matter. Um, we worked with the Environment and Natural Resources Committee in no less than 10 hearings and work sessions and really crafted a, you know, essentially recrafted um, the law that was passed into law. Um, and the work that was done by our hydrogeologists, our mining coordinator, um, our um, water quality experts, our um, hazardous waste experts, our solid waste experts, um, really went into the work that was done that created the law. I will be calling it the framework law because it really does create the framework, framework for the rules. Um, the rules are entitled Metallic Mineral Exploration, Advanced Exploration, and Mining uh, Rules. And the reason why I'm noting that is because we keep talking about the mining rules, but there are three different components. And that's particularly important because I want to talk a little bit about timing. Uh, uh, we've talked a lot about how you know, the process was rushed. I wanted to make sure that the committee had an understanding as to the timing associated with the work that the department's been doing since May of 2012. Um, the law required that we do routine technical rules, that we do major substantive rules, and that the Land Use Planning Commission um, do rules as well. And so in 2012, we got to work and we um, went out for an RFP to get um, a, an expert to help us with some of the research and preliminary drafting that we took and ran with and you know used as um, a jumping off point for some of the work that we did. Um, and we went to work on doing the routine technical rules. The routine technical rules were drafted in 2012 and were you know, adopted by the Department of Environmental Protection, which is the way that routine technical rules work in early 2013. Um, so it was only at that point that we could really begin to work on the major substantive component of the rules. So it was early 2013 that we turned our attention to the major substantive rules. We essentially had six months of you know, what seemed to be full-time work from five or six of our best staff and our most senior and experienced staff drafting the rules that ended up being somewhere between 80 and 100 pages. The work that was done by the um, staff 
was done by um, our mining coordinator. Um, he typically does traditional, what I call traditional mining, the quarry type of activities that you heard from Bob Marvini earlier today, um, but also was involved in the 1991 version of the rules and is very familiar with the metallic mineral mining rule um, requirements. Um, we had a hydrogeologist involved. We had um, somebody who regulates wastewater discharge involved in the process. Um, somebody who does um, solid waste disposal, what I call non-hazardous waste disposal and handling. Um, we had somebody who deals exclusively with hazardous waste management and disposal issues. Um, Jeff, in addition to coordinating, um, spent more than 20 years um, in our Air Bureau and served sort of as our Air Bureau expert and as, a well, as well as our, um, our, ex, you know, our, our coordinator um, of, of all of the work that was done. This team, you know, I, I didn't ask for individual estimates as to what they did, but I, I, it was pretty much a full-time job for a couple of months for the, for the experts involved, experts within our department. I call them experts um, who did this work. Jeff, Jeff. Um, as we promised to the legislature in 2012, um, we released a draft of the rules before they went public. Um, I, you know, I'm, part of what I'm doing up here is just making sure that everybody has, um, you know, an accurate depiction of, of what happened. And I've heard that we didn't really release a draft. We did, in fact, release a draft, and we actually incorporated some very good comments from that draft, uh, from that release of the draft, before we submitted them to the board for their consideration. We submitted the. Uh, the draft um, to the board for their consideration uh, the first week in September. The board um, met uh, a couple of weeks later to, cons to vote to uh, initiate rulemaking. And from that point on, we had several meetings with the board on this issue. We met on September 9th with the board. Um, at that point, we talked about several topics. Um, and began to uh, coordinate with the board and, and let the board know what the issues were. I have a quick question. I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you, yep. Cheney, because you're doing great. But when did you send out the draft for just general comment? It thought? was in August. of. Uh, we, we allowed for a, a, at least a few weeks of, of public notification and comment before we had to take you know, an additional week mm -hmm. to consider what comments came in and make the changes and get it to the board. Um, our idea, our, the idea was to give the public enough time to, you know, give us some big, tell us where, where we might have missed the mark, where we might have missed something, or, you know, where we could just strengthen things, um, knowing that there was going to be an extensive process in front of the board where we could, you know, tweak, you know, a, a, an issue here or an issue there. Um, so it was, it was at least three weeks, I'd say. About three weeks. Um, Good. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, before before we were presenting the rules in front of the board, um, we also the the team also briefed the uh, the board on mining in general. We gave them an overview session on mining, what the framework law was, what you know what is required, you know what the board would be required to consider. That briefing happened in the summer of 2012 um, before we uh, submitted the rules to the board um, for their consideration to help orient them, similar to what has been happening today um, uh, for, for you all. So just a few stats as I, as I go through this. Um, we calculated the number of hours that the board spent um, publicly and during the public hearings and public meetings and deliberations and they spent almost 40 hours um, you know sitting in seats in public forums considering uh, these rules um, and uh, that of course doesn't account for what you heard from you know from Bob Foley uh, with respect to the amount of time that was taken to take everything home and to read it and to consider it and to read all the comments um, and uh, and to come back and then have the dialogue with the staff at various meetings uh, about various subject matters want to get into 
So on S September 5th, we had the meeting with the board where the bo board voted to, to um, post the rule for, for public comment. At that point, um, it took a couple of weeks for that to happen. That's just the way it is. You send it to the Secretary of State, it takes a couple of weeks to get into the newspaper and to get posted. At that point, we need at least 30 days for the public to comment on this, and I think we might have even uh, allowed for a little bit of extra time because this was a significant rule. This was more than 80 pages, and we wanted to give the public an opportunity to really think about this, provide us their comments, provide us the information that they needed. Um, the board held a public hearing that lasted literally all day um, and received a lot of really good technical information um, from various members of the public in addition to the, the, um, the more general comments that they might, that they might have received. Um, on 11-21, we met with the board again and talked about additional subject matter. You know, we reviewed the comments. We said, here are the various topics that we've identified that seem to be coming up as themes. How do you want to deal with this? And Jeff and the technical staff had a back and forth with the board where they said, um, Here's an issue with respect to us saying that you're not allowed to mine in or under the waters of the state. Um, here's the technical information that you need to deal with, board. How do you want to handle this situation? There was a back and forth dialogue. As a result of the dialogue, um, in most instances, uh, the staff would get you know a directive from the board to go back and try to create some language um, to bring back to the board. This happened on uh, November 21st. It happened again on December 2nd. On December 2nd, it was determined that there were um, 10 items that were considered substantial changes to the rule that the board wanted to make, and the board went back out for public hearing and public uh, back out for public comment at that time uh, on those changes, on those 10 specific items. Um, after that, after that additional public comment period. Um, the, we took the information, the public comment information, we made sure the board all had that information in front of them, and again, sat down with the board and said, here are the items and themes that they had with respect to these uh, items. What do you want to do? And the board gave us more directive and more information. At that point, you know, the team went to work again and uh, made changes to the rule consistent with the directive of the board, and we went back to the board on January 2nd. On January 2nd, uh, you know, there was another dialogue with the board, and they had a, a significant amount of deliberation um, and back and forth with the staff, um, made final directives, or what we thought at the time were final directives to us to make, make the final changes. And at that point, the staff had a tremendously short period of time to develop what you've already heard was a 300-page basis statement. Um, the basis statement essentially is a compilation of everything that the board has been dis the board has discussed in the comments that have been received. Um, so this was all the the information and, and discussion that has been occurring that had been occurring for the past couple of months. Um, and then on January 10th, the board met for a final time and voted th somewhere after three o'clock in the afternoon, if I recall, um, to that they were going to provisionally adopt the rule. At that point, we had um, to make the changes to the basement statement to make the changes that the board had directed us to change and make the you know, minor changes to the rule to, uh, at the direction of the board and uh, rush back to the office and get on to several photocopiers to um, produce what I think was somewhere around 10,000 pages of paper. Um, and that they don't is, make uncoded in the state. <laughs> <laughs> and we had every photocopier going in the entire building, um, and uh, you know, so there, there's been a lot of discussion as to the process being rushed, and there's been a lot of discussion as to you know the late filing of these rules. Although I think you know, I think we, it's been made clear today that the, the very specific mining statute would have trumped that anyway. Um, we were a few minutes late after photocopying about 10,000 pages in an hour. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that we I had the opportunity to put that in context for you. Um, very briefly, I wanted to just give you the subject matter of the topics that were discussed 
um, at the various meetings. Most of the topics that I'm going to list for you were discussed with the board at several meetings. Um, most of these topics had some sort of change that the board had asked the department to make and go back and, and present to the board again. Um, and uh, most of these topics uh, had revisions from the time that we presented it to the board for their consideration to the time when the board provisionally adopted. Uh, the first one on the list is um, that we had originally uh, written in the proposal that waters in or under the uh, mining in or under the waters of the state would be prohibited um, as a straight prohibition. Um, conversation um, with technical staff amongst the board identified that you know that might not necess necessarily be. Um, needed for environmental protection in all instances and so there were revisions that were made to ensure that environmentally protective measures were in place but that the prohibition wasn't um, just a strict prohibition in all instances. There was a requirement regarding post-closure wastewater treatment. Um, you've heard a lot about um, that today, both with respect to the uh, term that is used of perpetual treatment. Um, there, we had originally proposed that there be a 30-day, um, a 30-year perpetual treatment requirement. That is consistent with RECRA, um, and um, we had proposed that. Um, Heather, not everybody knows what RECRA is. Thank you. I'm going to do that from time to time, and I, I appreciate you holding me to uh, to just not speaking yeah. environmental speak. RECRA is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. It's a federal law um, that deals with um, the uh, hazardous materials. You'll often hear cradle to grave. Um, that that was the original cradle to grave. Um, uh, prov federal provision to make sure that materials are handled properly from the time that they're generated to the time that they're disposed of however they're disposed of. Um, and, and so that can be extended to 60 years pretty quickly I think if I remember the rules right. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I've got to mix. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's monitoring. The, 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 the 60 years was a, a minimum of 30 years re required for monitoring but we can extend it that to 60 years if it's necessary to uh, or beyond that if it's necessary to ensure that proper monitoring takes place. Um, so the reason why we had, the reason why staff had identified 30 years is because it's consistent with the Resource Conservation Recovery Act um, and the amount of time that might be necessary to ensure that we um, identify a problem. If a problem uh, occurs after the 10-year mark um, and 10 years was the limit, um, Stacy um, had indicated at one point that there, there might be a, a question there as to whether or not that would be environmentally protective. Um, under, just follow up, under, under the, the NEPFA law, even if we say 15 years and there were a problem after that, federal law would take over. Th that's right. Not only that, but there is also, um, there are also provisions within the statute, the framework law itself, and the mining rules that deal with that. This is, um, that's an important point. I need to back up a little bit. Th we're talking about the requirement that the department has up front in order to get and give an applicant a permit. Right. The requirement, you know, we are, we had written into the rules that said, applicant, we will not give you a permit unless you can demonstrate to us uh, that you will not need to treat this waste beyond 30 years. Um, if, if that year were to, if that time period were to change, it would be applicant, we will not give you a permit unless, you know, it's 15 years or 10 years or what have you. Um, it, this is, this has nothing to do with um, either the ability to treat waste if it needs to be treated longer, if they missed the mark and didn't demonstrate it and we weren't able to uh, and we weren't able to identify that up front or, or to deal with an issue that has that happens after the fact. This is just to make sure that um, they don't come into us with an application that um, we know is going to be harmful to the environment forever in the future. Um, and we needed to make sure that we, we, we didn't have to just accept that. <coughs> so this is all pre-application. This is all application requirement material. As I think. Uh, Representative Tucker and then Representative Martin. Okay. I just didn't catch the time frame that you mentioned when you said that the permittee must demonstrate uh, that it will not require water treatment beyond X years, and you didn't, I didn't catch it. 
uh, 30 years is what we had proposed in the rule okay. and I believe that was that remained in the rule at uh, that was provisionally adopted yes, was, thank uh, you I just yes. missed the number yes Senate, representative Martin yeah thank you I think I think the originally uh, as I gather uh, the board had talked about going 10 years or so and then you recommended 30 but I'm not sure that it really under federal law if we were to go 10 or 15 or whatever under federal law uh, then the federal law takes precedent because the federal law says you're going to take care of it and and I hate to say this but I was actually working for Senator Muskie when he wrote the law. So, <laughs> so, you are old. so I am old. Uh, I make no qualms for it. And I was in Washington when the law was written. So, but but I think that 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 we we tend to think that we have everything. We have to do everything here. I think we probably should spend a little time looking at at the, at the federal law uh, because we think we have to solve it all here. But the federal law is very, very, very clear, and and if you look at the the, the stuff that the, the the hearing materials going back to, to that period, and you read through that and what has happened since then, uh, it's ironic because I was actually teaching that yes last night to my students at the UMF, at the UMFK through UMA, uh, which I teach conservation law at, at the university. So so, but I think I think that that, that that's something we we, we forget. We think it, we've got to do it all, and and so there's a lot more there. Yes, punish, please. Thank you. Um, so you, the three of us are all a little bit confused about you. You still want the 30 years? Is that what you would recommend or not? Sorry, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It, it, it's it's what we recommended to the board. Mm -hmm. It's what the is what was deliberated by the board, and so um, sitting up here today. Um, we're, we're here saying that you know there was a fairly extensive process that took place and you know we, we're just asking that whatever decision this committee makes um, that you you acknowledge that that process that took place I, I think Thank you. part of and, and, and that's a very good question I think what Heather is doing here for us is that there were there are allegations that 30 years was pulled out of the air right and uh, that that it was just a number it's federal law. And it's federal law, but it's also it, there was some thought to it with RICRA and others, yes. and and I think that's something we didn't get to last time, and we'll decide because we've asked for the the people that helped you write the permit to come and explain what their thought processes are. Uh, I know them very well, <laughs> and I know that they are um, very protective of the environment, and I, they really are. And so I, when I heard that they were the ones that suggested that, it made me stop in my tracks. And, and so that I think that's the important point that what Heather's trying to say, there was thought into that number. Right. There wasn't just a willy-nilly. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, Representative Tucker. Since we have these great experts Perhaps. here, um, does the EPA get involved in the permitting process or only the cleanup process? Mm -hmm. They don't get involved in the permitting process. Okay. So, But the Clean Water Act, they would be applicable to them. The Clean Air Act would be applicable to them. We're a delegated state. However, if we don't abide by what they say, they can be really nasty to us. So EPA would look at It'd it be, after the fact. No, they would look at it, and you can answer that. If, you're, if there's a waste treatment, water waste treatment system put in, EPA will have a potential say in that system, correct? Am I saying that right? We are a delegated state, and so the it's our program. Um, however, if we don't follow the Clean Water Act law, EPA, who you know delegates the program to us, could you know could hold hold us to that. If, if I if I could speak to um, the federal laws and other laws um, uh, for a moment. In the framework law and in the rules, it very explicit. There's an, a huge paragraph that you know, for those of you who got, who can actually see my fingers, is this big. And that paragraph, all it is, is all the laws that say all the laws that you have to comply with, um, regardless of what it says in the mining uh, mining rules. Um, what the mining rules do. As I'm skipping around my papers, I realize I skipped no, over going. this part. This what the mining rules do is before the before. All this came across and all before all this came about in uh, 2012 uh, all the mining rules were under what is called the site location of development act um, that is a uh, a state law 
um, that deals with any projects that are large in size, for example, over three acres um, in size. And it deals with a whole host of environmental and siting issues, such as noise and dust and um, you know, fitting harmoniously into the environment soils. and soils and, you know, making sure that, you know, there is proper storm water associated with it. It deals with all, all kinds of uh, environmental issues. Um, when the original mining rules from 1991 were developed, um, a lot of the laws, the state laws that, that exist today didn't exist, at least not in the form that they exist now. Um, and so uh, what the, what part of what the framework law did was say for these state rules and these state programs that the state of Maine administers, let's create a one-stop shopping to, you know, to streamline this, to make sure that the hazardous people are talking to the, the solid waste people, and to make sure that, you know, if there's going to be a public hearing on this, that there's one public hearing and not four. Let's make sure that there's coordination of all of these different programs, and let's make sure that the, the how we regulate the mining um, is consistent with how we regulate all of our environmental laws today as opposed to in 1991 um, where there's been you know 20 years of changes that have happened in the meantime um, in the law and in the rule there is a paragraph that says um, the following laws will be uh, must have their own permits and must be administered separately um, but you have to coordinate with with the timing and and information sharing with with all the other mining um, permitting activities clean air act clean water act you know underground injection uh, natural resources protection act um, are just uh, some that pop to mind as permits that you would need to get separately that you would need to comply with all of the requirements um, of the clean air act the clean water act uh, Natural Resources Protection Act, which is a state uh, law. Um, you need to comply with all of those resources, resource, recra, resource. Recovery. <laughs> yeah, it's late sure. in the day. I got it right the first time. Um, so, so even though this is a framework law and even though this